Hello, my name is Houston, and this is Media Mood Board. Yes, that's right. My name's Houston, and this is Media Mood Board, a weekly show about hyper-specific entertainment lists. Well, I try to release a video weekly. I traveled one week, and then surprise got sick, uh, so I uh, missed two weeks. So today, I just wanted to kind of chat about some of the stuff I've been uh, digging in the last few weeks. I'm currently working on a multi-form review of Final Fantasy 16. meant for it to come out the end of February, but after I kind of got into the research process, I kind of got some ideas for something a little bit bigger. So I'm, I'm done with half of it. It'll come out at the end of this month. I've pretty much done all the research, but games. So I got a bunch of games that I got lined up to play this month uh, to kind of flesh it out. But I say this because a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today was a part of that research process for the video. So see if you can find the uh, the tendrils. I did a lot of reading last month, which was really fun. I read three out of the four books in Octavia Butler's The Patternist series. I read the first book in R.F. Kuang's The Poppy War series. And I'm currently 500 pages into the first of the Stormlight Archive series, Brandon Sanderson's The Way of Kings. So caught myself into a lot of uh, long uh, series uh, last month, which is not great for uh, trying to complete something on time. But sometimes you start researching something with the idea of you'll touch it and then go. You choose something as representative of something, and then you just end up getting sucked into it and wanting to read more. Let's talk about Poppy Wars first, just because that is one that I just read the first one. And if I wasn't doing a project, I would probably have just gone on to the second one. For the pattern of series, all the books are, are short enough that it felt like, ooh, I can really get into it. And each one of them felt, uh, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Poppy War. Two reasons I picked up Poppy War. One, because it seemed to have a lot of thematic elements that I was looking at to tie into Final Fantasy 16. And also, I read Yellowface last year, which was this author's foray into like literary fiction. And I thought it was a lot of fun. So I was interested in seeing where her roots were she's more known as like a fantasy author it turns out it's really good i really really loved uh this first book in the poppy war trilogy the poppy war um, way, way more than yellow face actually i know they're different but you know that is what it is so like always i write my own little synopsis so i'll just read it an orphan thinks she has escaped a life of poverty when she makes it into a prestigious military academy but when she discovers that she might have a rare ability to channel the power of ancient gods her life gets much more complicated. This is definitely a fantasy novel through and through. The interesting hook to it is that Kuang is a, a historian, specifically like Chinese history. And the world that this is set in is is based off of the Song Dynasty in China. And it's, it, it, it's extremely meticulously researched. I watched a few um, videos uh, and lectures with her after reading this. At the risk of starting off this video with uh, a guy talking about a book about World War II submarines <laughs> or something of that tone, uh, this is a very anime feeling book as well. There's crazy, crazy powers. People get punched and like, you know, electricity like shoots through the ground because of it. There's also lots of cool, weird characters. Uh, they interact with a bunch of shamans. And for instance, one of them is a shaman to a river god and he has forgone his physical body. Um, and so he is just a puddle, a sentient puddle of water that lives in a barrel. So it's got it's got big fantasy swings like that, but the book is is really really brutal. The war she is paralleling was full of war crimes uh, against China uh, by the Japanese military, and she doesn't shy away from those details or paralleling these in this story. So not only is there realistic depictions of just what normally happens in war, there's this above and beyond human evil that's shown and because this is heightened to a, a supernatural level you get this really weird interesting back and forth between characters who are feeling this immense uh godlike power and kind of the fragility of the human body and how dehumanizing war is that makes it sound like it's a, an extremely grim book it does have grim parts but for the most part it's fun and because it's able to play in both worlds, I think that's what makes it so 
interesting to read and and, and really effective uh, on top of all the characters being uh, really interestingly drawn but those three books in the series i read the first one it, it was about 500 ish pages i was like oh man i want to see what happens next but i know if i want to make uh, a review video of Final Fantasy 16. I can't read this whole series and still have time to read the other things I wanted to, watch the other things I wanted to, etc., etc. So I just had to set that down. One series that I didn't do that for, Octavia E. Butler's The Patternist series. The Patternist series was released throughout the late 70s and early 80s. An interesting thing formally about this series is instead of following a character's journey across several books, Butler's more interested in kind of a top-down view of a society over time. The broad story is it is about a rise of a telepathic race of humans from just two until they take over the whole Earth. Each book is about 200 pages and tells a vignette of a different point within several centuries of this telepathic culture's growth. So there'll be a book set in like the 1600s and there'll be a book set in like the 70s and then there'll be a book set in the far future, uh, that sort of thing. While telling somewhat related stories, you lose the impact and the push of like, what's gonna happen to this character that I love next? You do get something really interesting in that each book is almost a different genre. One is a thriller. One is a coming-of-age story. One is uh, almost just a romance. One is a straight sci-fi. It's also the kind of book series where you have to watch a couple videos uh, to figure out what order you're supposed to read the books in, and there's not a consensus. To make it brief, the two main camps are chronological and publication date. I'm going to read my notes for this, but the chronological order is Wild Seed, which tells the story of the first mutants meeting each other. Mind of My Mind, which takes place over a century later. Uh, one of the original mutants is 4,000 years old at this point and is scouring the world for a mutant with specific abilities to help him maintain control over the mutant population. Smaller jump for this next one, Clay's arc jumps forward a few decades and tells the story of a new mutant strain caused by a parasite brought back to space by an astronaut. And then the series ends with The Pattern Master, uh, which takes place in the far future where the telepathic mutants and the parasitic mutants are at war with each other. There's also a fifth novel called Survivor, which Fish takes help. place in between when the parasite comes to Earth and then full-fledged war in the Pattern Master, but Butler herself disowned it, um, so I don't count it. So the difference is publication order, completely different. The final book, Pattern Master, where the big war happens, that was the first one published, and there's an extra wrinkle, and then it was also Butler's debut novel. Just because it's her debut novel, it doesn't mean it's not good, but there is a noticeable drop in quality from the other books that I read in the series and The Pattern Master. And honestly, what kept me going in The Pattern Master was I was invested in the world and where everything was going. If I would have read it first, I'm not sure if I would have read the other books in the series. It's still good in Pattern Master, but it just feels a little bit more disjointed. It doesn't push you along. It's just someone early in their career. I chose to read it in chronological order, and for me, that was the right move. I had a really good time with it. So after I read all those, I was deciding what to read next, and uh, a week or two ago, my friend Ray had recommended that I read Brandon Sanderson's The Way of Kings after he heard that I was gonna be making a Final Fantasy 16 video. He said there were some interesting things in it that he thought matched up. I've always wanted to read Brandon Sanderson. I have Mistborn on my shelf and have had it for a long time and just never sat down to look at it. I know he's really well regarded. So I figured, you know what? This book is like over a thousand pages, uh, but I feel like I've already done enough research book-wise for the video. So even if this doesn't end up being something that I include, it will be fun for me to read, an excuse for me to do it. And uh, I shouldn't let the long page count um, get in my way since I've already done the research anyway, so it's, I, it wouldn't be in the back of my mind. He warned me that it starts off slow, and it does. You get introduced to like what feels like 800 characters and uh, 100 pages worth of rules for the world, 
uh, which is not true. But once the story got going, I got something to hold on to. I really fell in love with that. Like I said, there is a ton going on so much that I don't think I could really properly encapsulate at this point, especially since I'm just halfway through. Uh, let me read the Wikipedia article just to illustrate how all over the place this book is in a good way. The story rotates between the points of view of, and then it names like six characters, and several other minor characters who lead seemingly unconnected lives. That's the uh, Wikipedia description. But Brandon Sanderson is known for his world building. That's what he loves to do uh, and telling it through all these different people. And one fun thing that I've come across is when those stories start to intersect, it really like builds really in a really fun way also has a lot of anime stuff going on in it uh, but here is my uh synopsis for what it is now we'll see how accurate this is as the book goes on here's the hook centuries ago there's a group of knights known as the radiance today all the remains of them are their armor and weapons each which gift its owners godlike abilities the way of kings follows the lives of multiple characters living in the world in which this history takes place it's cool <laughs> I didn't watch as much in February. I was more reading books. So just some highlights. Saw Lisa Frankenstein uh, in theaters. It was super, super fun. Kind of a Heathers-y vibe. Great art direction. Glad to see Diablo Cody being talked about again. For those of you who don't know, Lisa Frankenstein is this dark rom-com set in the 80s about this goth high schooler. She has got this big crush on this person that has died a long time ago and she goes like to a cemetery and like sits next to his grave and things like that and there's a lightning strike or something happens and uh this person is reanimated and she tries to have a relationship with this um zombie they take some big fun artistic swings uh some dream sequency things and stuff like that it's interesting this released in february when it was i get it valentine's day but normally that's kind of when people drop things they don't think will do that well and i truly think this is a movie that could be released later in the year and get a lot of hype behind it i hope it finds a second life on streaming i know that that sydney sweeney uh anyone but you ended up having kind of a second life and people really like that so hopefully this gets the same amount of attention it's a movie that has a lot of love in its production the performances are all super fun in this too uh, I especially thought that it was interesting that the lead actor in this, he does not speak because he's a zombie. And so he does a lot of fun uh, physical stuff. Uh, another highlight was I really enjoyed Brian De Palma's The Fury. It's a supernatural horror movie that he released in the late 70s. It's also about telepaths. It stars Kirk Douglas and John Cassavetes. The Fury feels like a 90s alt comic, even though it was written in the late 70s. It tells the story of this ex-CIA agent whose son is telepathic. The government ends up comes, takes his son, and he goes to seek out a school for gifted telepaths to try and help them locate and track down his son. And he goes on kind of a manhunt to try and break through the ranks and, and, and rescue his child. It's the late 70s, so this is not CGI, it's like squibs and, and weird effects. And, and think, this is before scanners, but think scanners. It's kind of slow in bits, doesn't land the whole time, but I had such a good time with it. I, lo I, I, I would go as far to say as I love it. Um, I know. Anyways, I recommend it. It's really fun, especially if you like like these kind of like overly gritty uh, like 90s alt comics. It, it just feels like there's an alternate universe where this is what Marvel movies uh, or DC movies look like, and it's just like, Oh, okay. Okay, interesting. I also I also really got into Matt Reeves's reboot of the Planet of the Apes series. I'd written it off as just like cheesy like popcorn movie without any substance, but man, it's really good. The first one especially has kind of an arc that you can like telegraph from a mile away, but it is emotionally effective. But honestly, there's a lot of depth that's going on in the things that they're talking about. Very bare bones description. I'm sorry if you love this series, it's probably gonna butcher it, but first one, pharmaceutical company trying to develop a medicine to cure Alzheimer's. They're testing it on chimps. Turns out if there's not anything to fix, it just makes the brain cells stronger. It's not good for humans, it kills them, but for chimps, monkeys, apes, makes them all incredibly smart. We follow one of the chimps who is kind of put into captivity. We see his consciousness arise and then these questions of like, okay, well, how would we treat something that has this consciousness that we didn't think was intelligent enough beforehand? How do we treat them? What are their rights, etc. 
Sometimes you see this kind of narrative with like robot stories as well. The second one, we jump forward in time and the apes have created their own society and the humans are kind of, they don't, neither one of them knows the other one is even alive anymore. It's very harrowing. Basically, the second one starts out talking about a global pandemic that's wiped out most of the human race. So that was fun. But it's interesting because it's a little bit more about like the politics of the internal ape society in fighting in their different ideologies and then being confronted with this human race. And neither one of them really trust each other. Well, some of them do, some of them don't. It's a little bit more of an action movie than I wanted it to be. Uh, but there is like some really interesting characters and, and, and questions that it raises up. So the third movie, apparently, I haven't seen it yet, uh, is about a war between the humans and the apes. A new entry to the series is coming out, I think, this year. Uh, not directed by the same person. So that's I don't really have an opinion on that or, or what I think about or I'm, if I'm excited about that yet. But I really love the series. I think there's a lot to chew on. It's a really fun blockbuster filmmaking that has more going on under the hood than it has uh, any right to. Also, the, the, the performers in mocap that do the the ape acting especially like andy circus i don't know how he didn't win something this is crazy he, it's, it's 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 really good performing also i don't know why but the cg actually looks really good even though it's like from 2007 uh, it looks better than like some of the cg that i see in movies more recently and then finally i just want to touch on i've been making my way through uh, charles burnett's filmography i saw to sleep with anger a year or two to go and it is one of my favorite movies the basic plot is there's a family that moved away from the south uh, during the great migration and have kind of set up their life there and someone from their past that still lives in the south comes out to see them and these kind of weird spiritual things start happening it almost feels like a fable incredible performances uh, uh, the script is just next level. I love, love, love to sleep with anger. I watched an interview with Burnett earlier this month and was like, man, I really need to go back and watch his other stuff. Some of it's hard to find. Uh, so I've been doing that. In the late 70s at UCLA, there was this group of filmmakers that came together, called themselves the LA Rebellion. It was a group of black American filmmakers inspired by the French New Wave, which told these, you know, stories with low budgets uh, about, about real people and that were very personal and auteuristic. And they wanted to tell about the communities that they came from, uh, the black American communities of California, which they didn't see properly represented in big movies especially at that time like black exploitation was a huge genre maybe the most obvious contemporary influence that the la rebellion had was julie dash directed uh, daughters of the dust which uh, beyonce then used as inspiration uh, for lemonade but Charles Barnett was part of this crew. His uh, thesis, uh, Killer of Sheep, er, is this series of poetic vignettes shot in black and white about a small California town. You kind of follow this uh, dreamer of a main character. He's a little bit head in the clouds, a little poetic, uh, but he works at a slaughterhouse and it's very loose. There's not really that much that goes on to the story. There's not a clear arc. There's not anything like that. It's just kind of showing these these really beautiful uh, vignettes. It can fall into uh, thesis feeling territory. Uh, and by that, I mean that sometimes you can feel the storyteller trying to uh, make you feel something, but that doesn't detract from it and even highlights when he's not doing that. And it's fun to have that ambition to be trying those things. He also employs a lot of non-actors, which is really interesting. And I don't know why his stuff isn't spoken about the same as other things in like neorealist movements, like, you know, like Bicycle Thieves and things like that. There's a real tragedy with these people, Barnett included, which is they never really got the funding that their talents should give them. Barnett's still alive and he's still not getting funding. There was an interview I watched with him. One of the things he talked about is like, I can hope to pay off my kids college one day. After Killers of Sheep, My Brother's Wedding, it's it's in color, it's another vignette -y thing. It's another thing about community, society, where you belong. Another tragic story. It got butchered by the production company and it screened, I think maybe just a handful of times at festivals and then didn't get a great reception, so it was never released. And then a decade or two later, it finally got released, which is crazy, which is crazy. He was just sitting, he made his second film and then it just sat on it. 
To Sleep With Anger came later. It was one of his first ones, if not his first one, that employed actors, not non-actors. Danny Glover gives this crazy performance in it. It's so, so good. But, you know, uh, I, I haven't made his way through the rest of his filmography yet, but I'm really excited to. His shorts are equally good. One of his more recent shorts was just shot on this digital camera. It looks... 2001 is shit you know what i mean and the they're not actors so the acting's just like okay but the themes in it and the characters and the things they're talking about are really really good it's powerful there's still other of his like full-length movies that i i need to watch and i'm excited to do uh and i'll talk about those once i get to them out of the shorts that i've watched my favorite is when it rains which like a lot of his other stuff it's it's very just community-based and uh, a, a small uh, in a big way but it's just about this guy helping his friend go door to door asking to borrow money that's all it's about but it's beautiful it's beautiful <laughs> reading was my main hobby uh last month and this month is really going to be game heavy um in order to do research for the final fantasy 16 video the one i've started most recently is yakuza zero for those of you who don't know yakuza is this extremely long-running series that plays like a Japanese soap opera. Yakuza 0 is commonly referred to as the entry point to the series. Not the first one that was released, but it's the one that people recommend starting with. It is a prequel to the stories. Uh, it takes place in the 80s and is about this young Yakuza member who gets framed for uh, murder as part of this like real estate scheme that one of the gangs is uh, undertaking. The game is half like life sim, like walking around a busy town and stopping into a hamburger shop and eating uh, or going to karaoke or hanging out with your friends. And the other half is like a fighting game thing so you'll run into other gangs will run into you and it turns into like a uh, learning combos and leveling up your skills and stuff like that i tried some other games of the series before but bounced off it for whatever reason maybe i just wasn't in the right headspace but playing it now i'm loving it it's a real good time uh it's maybe just one of those games you have to be in the right uh right place for right now one of my favorite things about it is i'm really loving how they gamify all the different parts of life to really make this feel like a like someone's full experienced life uh but it feels still gamey at the same time uh which is really fun reminds me of shinmu which i uh i adore i'm also trying not to get distracted by this new game that came out called Bellatro, which is a roguelike poker game it looks really fun reminds me of the simplicity of something like um like the set I don't remember the 3DS game where there was the horses and solitaire. Anyways, that's all I've got. Thank you so much for watching. Was there anything that you saw or read last month that you were really excited about? I'll be back next week with another hyper specific entertainment list. My name is Houston. This is Media Mood Board. Bye.